Ja, dann geht's los, sehr geehrte Frau Professor Ryan, well, lieber Herr Professor Kircher, Professor Ryan, Professor Kircher, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's with great pleasure that I extend my cordial welcome at this occasion of the Thomas Mann lecture that is held at the ETH Zurich on this Tuesday. My name is Raphael Ball. I'm the director of the ETH Library, and uh, it's a great pleasure, as I said, to be hosting this event together with the Thomas Mann Archives and the uh, Professorship uh, of uh, Literature that are jointly hosting this lecture. Obviously, it's with great pleasure that I would have welcomed you physically here, perhaps in our beautiful Semper Auditorium. And obviously, I would have loved to invite you to drinks after this event, event to carry on the conversations around the uh, talk that we will hear this afternoon. But uh, COVID does not allow for us to meet physically. Um, travel, particularly travel across the oceans, is still vastly difficult. We will therefore have to make do with what we get online. We will deal with the content online, and we will try to replace uh, the physical meetings with all the more dedication to the content and postpone physical meetings until later. But there is an additional offer for you, because this is the first time that the Thomas Mann lectures are held in two languages. You now have the choice to either listen to the keynote this evening in German, the original or in the English translation. We thus expand our offer uh, across national boundaries and across linguistic boundaries, and uh, we welcome all the international members of our Thomas Mann network. Welcome to today's talk to everyone who is interested in Thomas Mann, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to have Professor Judith Ryan as the keynote lecturer at the occasion of this fifth Thomas Mann lecture. She will be talking about Thomas Mann and crowd or mass psychology. She will be researching a topic that is of particular interest and relevance uh, in our days. She will look at the entire oeuvre by Thomas Mann, but specifically she will focus on Thomas Mann's text, uh, Mario and the Magician from 1930, that uh, is staged in uh, Mussolini's Italy. Professor Ryan casts her glance at this uh, political novel, but she casts her eyes far beyond the political aspects to deal with uh, mass psychology, and she traces uh, Thomas Mann's interest in mass psychological phenomena throughout his oeuvre. Uh, I'm very interested in her reflections on this uh, topic, and I welcome uh, Judith Ryan. Uh, from Zurich. I also like to thank Professor Andreas Kirche for having uh, helped to host uh, this uh, Thomas Mann lecture. I also thank Katrin Bedenek from the ETH Library, and I thank colleagues Michael Baumann and Gabi Hollander who have helped organize uh, the Thomas Mann lectures this year. For the introduction of the speakers, I will give the floor to the uh, President of the uh, Foundation, Professor Andreas Kirchner. Thank you very much, Mr. Ball. I would also like to welcome you, ladies and gentlemen, at the occasion of this fifth Thomas Mann lecture that takes place at the ETH in Zurich. Well, uh, that takes place virtually. Uh, I would have far preferred to have you with us live. But uh, we will be broadcasting live, and I am very sure that this is not going to be detrimental to the content of the lecture. I can introduce uh, to you an exceptional speaker, Judith Ryan. Dear Judith Ryan, 
Good evening and welcome from the ETH Zurich to Harvard University. It's great to have you here. It is indeed a great pleasure and very much an honor that you've accepted our invitation to speak at the occasion of the fifth Thomas Mann Lectures and to share your uh, insights in Thomas Mann and mass psychological phenomena. Many of you are familiar with Judith Ryan, I'm sure. I'd still like to introduce uh, her. Judith Ryan has been professor of German and comparative literature at the University of Harvard since 1985. Before getting there, she was a Germanist and comparatist at the Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, she held very many important faculty functions also at Harvard, and she was also a leading member of the eminently important Modern Language Association in the United States, as well as the Northeast Modern Language Association where she chaired various committees. Apart from that, she was also president of the Modern Humanities Research Council, and uh, Judith is on the editorial board of several important literary science journals, among them the German Quarterly. I'd like to emphasize Judith Ryan's engagement as vice president and, after 1998, uh, president of the Kafka Society of America. This is a the subject matter that I'm particularly interested in. This is how we got to know one another. Um, our friendship is based on Kafka. The degree to which her work is appreciated can also be seen from the many awards she has received, amongst them grants from the Alexander von Humboldt Stifting, the Humboldt Forschungspreis, as well as the many guest professorships she has held. Judith Ryan is a great expert of German and comparative literature of the 19th and 20th century with a focus on poetry, colonial, post-war and uh, contemporary literature. She has uh, taught, researched and published on Franz Kafka, Hermann Broch, Paul Celan, Christa Wolff, Günther Grass, Durs Grimbein, uh, W.G. Sebald and, of course, uh, Thomas Mann. In 2002, she published her contribution, Buddenbrooks Between Realism and Aestheticism, in the Cambridge Companion to Thomas Mann, published by Richie Robertson. I mentioned Richie Robertson amongst uh, others because he was uh, the last Thomas Mann lecturer. With a view to the topic of today, I'd like to mention those works where Judith Ryan dealt with the questions of interrelationships between modern psychology and modern literature. And this is true, amongst others, for the monography The Vanishing Subject, Early Psychology and Literary Modernism from 1991, where she uh, dealt with the relationship of English, French and German-speaking writers between 1870 and 1940 in an interdisciplinary and intertextual way. Particularly relevant is also her analysis of Hermann Broch's highly complex political psychological opus magnum, the so-called Mass Hysteria Project. Uh, recently, an article was published on this, Hermann Broch's Massenwahn project and its relevance for our times in, companion, in the companion to the works of Hermann Broch in 2019. So, not just in Germany, but also in the United States, companions, uh, companion books are being published on such important matters. Hermann Broch was also one of the authors with whom Thomas Mann corresponded and not least, they were quasi-neighbors in Princeton after 1938. There are many differences, but they were united in their distrust of uh, mass manipulations such as it emerged in the 1920s and such as it became a su uh, factor of success in National Socialism. Mass hysteria with Broch, mass uh, or crowd psychology with Thomas Mann, uh, this 
conversation is no coincidence. It is the expression of a heightened, even seismographic sensitivity with regard to those questions. And by the way, the two writers were not alone with this question. Also, and particularly the members of the Institutes for Social Research in, with it, in its exile in America worked on doing research on mass psychology uh, as a theory of uh, fascism, among them Theodor Adorno and Erich Fromm. Judith Ryan will shed light on this question on the basis of uh, Thomas Mann's story or uh, short novel, Mario and the Magician from 1930. As has been said already, she will use this text and others to show how Thomas Mann dealt with mass psychological phenomena and how an understanding of them already became apparent in his novel Buddenbrocks from uh, 1901. But I obviously do not want to second guess what Judith Ryan is about to explain to us. Dear Judith, all that remains for me to say is that we are very much looking forward to your uh, keynote. I'm happy to give you the floor in just a second, but also from my side, allow me to thank to thank the ETH Library and its uh, director, Raphael Ball, whom we have just heard, who sees these lectures as part of its public relations work of the Pop uh, Thomas Mann archives. And I'd also like to thank the uh, team members of the Thomas Mann archives that have helped organize this event, particularly Katrin Benedict and Gabriele Hollander and all the others that uh, are playing a role. So thank you also from my side. And with this, any, without any further ado, the floor is yours, Judith. Dr. Ball, Professor Kilcher, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank you for the honor of being able to speak here in this lecture series. Having the opportunity to talk about Thomas Mann and mass psychology allows me to broaden a long-standing interest for the connection between literature and psychology, which is most delightful for a literary scholar as myself. I would also like to thank Mr. Kilcher for his kind introduction, especially because he also mentioned Kafka and not only the very serious authors like Broch, who he had to mention, of course, in this connection. It's very nice to have a slightly different context or hear about it here. Has Kafka even, or did Kafka even know anything about mass psychology? I really have to think about that. On this occasion, I really have to mention two colleagues at the ETH Zurich, Dr. Katrin Bedenik and Gabrielle Hollander, who have played a crucial part for the success of this project. With their help and in collaboration with other colleagues at ETH, the flyer, which is a fascinating montage of documents of the Thomas Mann archive from the years around 1930, was created. My sincere gratitude to all of you. My topic, Thomas Mann and Mass Psychology, allows me to embark on a little explored path in Thomas Mann's scholarship, and I hope that I will not only be able to shed a light on the unknown aspect of the intellectual and literary development of the Nobel Prize winner, but also on his extraordinary gift for identifying new thought patterns. Strictly speaking, the word mass psychology couldn't have been part of Thomas Mann's vocabulary, but he seems to have been aware of related phenomena early on. As many of his contemporaries, he probably knew about the great social psychologist Gustave Le Bon, 
who published a groundbreaking book, Psychologie des Foules, in 1895 in Paris. The French word fool means crowd. The quick success of the book led to translations into many languages. The German version was published in 1908 under the title Psychologie der Massen, so Psychology of Crowds. This translation entailed that Le Bon was quickly seen as the father of mass psychology in German-speaking countries soon after. That's, of course, a very different kind of mass psychology than it's the case with Hermann Broch. The main idea of Le Bon's book was the view of a soul that developed in larger crowds. The term of the crowd soul was very well received and started spreading in the broader public. Le Bon also claimed that every crowd would provoke a contagion so that participants who would have seen themselves as individuals usually were seeing themselves as practically anonymous within the crowd and were more easily impressionable. In that sense, Le Bon argued that the crowd would cast a hypnotic spell over the individuals. And I will come back to that later. Since the early stages of Le Bon's psychological theories, a lot of ink has been used up about the question how massa, group, crowd, mob were acceptable translations for Le Bon's concept of fool in French. That's probably not surprising, since it is always or almost always the case that synonyms aren't semantically congruent totally. Within this lecture series, we are using two languages, German and English, and in these languages there are two terms which are used as translations for Le Bon's Psychologie des Foules. In German, that's Massenpsychologie, and in English, it's crowd psychology. The two flyers are using these two terms from the two languages. So, when listening to me, please always note that I always refer to Masse and the English crowd. When looking at Thomas Mann, we can see two phases of his grasp of the psychology of people. However, he under his understanding goes beyond theoretical social psychology. The first phase that I would like to show is a phase of observation and intuition that lays the basis for something like mass psychology in his early works. This phase becomes most evident when looking at Thomas Mann's first novel, Buddenbrooks, from 1901. We will take a look at two characteristic passages here later on. In both cases, it's about trains of thoughts that are very close to Le Bon's theory. The second phase of Thomas Mann's exploration of mass psychology can be found in his novella or narrative Mario and the Magician from 1930, where he elaborates further consequences of the train of thought of Le Bon's. And in that case, because he was focused strongly on texts by Sigmund Freud. In this phase, I will loosely follow the, the ideas behind Freud's essay, Mass Psychology and Ego Analysis, from 1921. In that essay, Freud explains the reciprocal relationship between the individual human being and the mass or the crowd. Contrary to popular belief, 
the essay isn't about analyzing the pressure of the group or the crowd on the individual, but about detecting the impulses that make the individuals reflect on, on themselves and to develop an unexpected self-analysis. Freud exen- extensively cites Le Bon's psychologie des foules in his essay. And his dual title implies that the concept of mass on the one hand and the ego analysis are equally balanced. My talk will follow the sequence of three works of Thomas Mann's, Buddenbrook's 1901, Mario and the Magician, 1930, and Confessions of Felix Krull, where the late drafts were developed in 1953 and 54. I hope that in a slightly longer version of my talk, I will be able to come back to the magic mountain as I had originally planned. Fortunately, Richie Robertson, my predecessor in this lecture series, has held a substantial analysis on enlightenment and anti-enlightenment tendencies in the Magic Mountain. And you can listen to that online. In the last part of my talk, I will take a very quick glance at a third phase of Thomas Mann's thoughts about mass psychology, a phase where he leaves behind known theorists and social norms in favor of a fantastical trip around the world. And this is where a completely new logic emerges that is shaped intellectually rather than socially. And the leading question is, is it really possible to live a double life, a reflection on society turns to an unexpectedly tough nut to crack for Felix here. Before I come to the three main texts of Thomas Mann, let me outline a few things about Hermann Broch. His project, an extensive paper on mass hysteria, was a try to understand the the rise to power of the national socialists and to look at how to avoid similar things in the future. So he had the hope to avoid such mass movements in the future. I would now like to move on to Thomas Mann. Could we scroll down a little bit faster here, please? Thomas Mann Mann goes down an entirely different path on such deliberations, and he does so with very literary means. However, I would now like to go back to more innocent times for talking about Thomas Mann's first phase of understanding psychology of people within social contexts. Concerning mass psychology in a broader sense, Thomas Mann had already taken his first steps of developing an independent mini-social psychology in his first novel, Buddenbrooks. In order to identify something like a mass psychology in the sense of Gustave Le Bon in Mann's Buddenbrooks novel, we only need to look at the sudden changes of emotions and opinions of Tony Buddenbrook. We will then observe how diligently Thomas Mann has rendered the phenomenon, the phenomenon in literary form. You will remember that Tony, or 
Antonia Budenbrook in full was born as a second child to her parents in between her brothers Thomas and Christian. Due to her unconventional and not always very considerate comments, Tony is reprimanded repeatedly by her parents. And when she starts flirting with an older pupil at the age of 15, her parents decide to give Tony into the strict supervision of Theresa Weichbrot's pension. As an example for Tony's experience in boarding school, I would like to look at a small but significant scene. It is a kind of look into the future that connects the, the bigger picture with the different characters. Three of the pupils swear a vow of friendship based on their common classes and their shared dormitory. A conversation at that time reveals, however, that the three pupils do not agree on the very thrilling topic of marriage, despite the vow of friendship. Amgand von Schilling dreams of getting married to a noble man with a large estate. Tony Buddenbrook claims that she will, of course, marry a rich businessman. However, Gerda Arnoldson proclaims to probably take a very different route she says, I will most likely not get married. Those were complicated times. This vignette shows how carefully Thomas Mann, in just a few strokes, showed the balance between this vow of friendship and the individual young women. Contrary to Le Bon, Thomas Mann often describes smaller groups, which leads to a differentiation of three opinions here. In this context, Gerda's statement might sound exotic and adventurous. However, Gerda is a very talented violinist who could have chosen a career on the concert stages of the world, but in the end, she gets married to Tony's brother, Thomas. As a second example of the presence of a crowd psychology in the novel Buddenbrooks, I would like to look at the depiction of a summer holiday in Travemünde. In order to protect Tony from the gossip of other summer visitors, her father sees to it that she is taken in as a guest in the house of the tugboat commander and his wife. Based on the Travemünde chapter, I would like to show how diligently Thomas Mann draws the relationship between the individual and a group and how he makes Le Bon's crowd psychology become an important piece of the novel's structure by refinements and ironic refractions. The Travemünde chapter always re almost reads like a lesson on Le Bon's mass psychology. Using Morten Schwarzkopf as an antagonist to the elegant visitors from the city, Thomas Mann makes a very happy choice. Through Morton, he places a young person in the storyline whose social identity hasn't been firmly established yet and who belongs to the up-and-coming generation. During the holidays, Morton is just the son of a tugboat commander but the rest of the year he's a medical student in Göttingen. So, socially speaking, he's falling between two stools. Furthermore, he's a member of a fraternity, so a group who strongly influences his socialist opinions. In contrast to Tony, Morton stays an outsider in Travemünde 
who stays away from the visitors and who prefers to sit on the rocks. One morning he decides to accompany Tony to the sea temple and he doesn't only want to take a romantic walk but also wants to introduce the young lady from the city to his new political thoughts. He sits in a small changing room at the sea temple with Tony and answers Tony's question about a ship with the rigging in the distance. It is a ship sailing from Prussia to Russia. All of a sudden, Morton takes out a narrow ribbon that identifies him as a member of a political group whose goal is to break down the class society. In connection with his fraternity, Morton enthusiastically speaks about the aspirations for freedom in Russia, who that, that slowly starts to resonate in German-speaking countries as well. However, not so in Prussia, where the king at that time, Frederick William IV, was quite oppressive and anti-liberal. In the middle of his enthusiasm for the social goals of the fraternity, Morton doesn't even think about defining the word freedom. At the end of the scene at the Sea Temple, the two young people look out into the distance. And Tony felt she was suddenly at one with Morton in a vast, indefinite understanding, full of presentiment and longing of what the word freedom meant. With characteristic irony, the narrator unveils the possibility that a very small group, so Morton and Tony, with the fraternity as a semi-secret support for them, can be considered a group or a crowd, and that the formation of a group doesn't necessarily lead to uniform opinions. We know that after returning from, from Travemünde, Tony writes down the date of her engagement to Bendix Grünlich and not Morten Schwarzkopf in the Family Chronicles. I would now like to move on to a more complicated aspect of today's topic, namely man's possible knowledge of Freud's essay, Group Psychology and the Analysis of the Ego from 1921. As we've just seen, Mann's deliberation about the relationship between the individual and the greater social group are shown in his first um, novel, Buddenbrooks. And we can see that two decades before the publication of Freud's essay, he dealt with similar ideas already. Let's now turn to the narrative Mario and the Magician, a text that is being considered as an exemplary text for Mann's interest in mass psychology. Through allusions to Mussolini and the Italian fascists, the narrative makes his fears for the spread of such mass movements quite clear. But he always circles back to different topics. To what degree can we find traces of Freud's theory of the tension between the mass and the analysis of the ego in the Mario texts? First of all, we will need to take a closer look at Freud's descriptions of the issue. In the first sentences of his essay, he states the idea as an opposite of individual social or mass psychology. But he sees that definition in a completely different sense than Le Bon's. He starts from Le Bon's con concept of the crowd soul. And that theory is also closely analyzed 
in the second paragraph of Freud's essay, but he arrives at the conclusion that Le Bon declares the state of the individual in the mass as being genuinely hypnotized and not merely comparable to a hypnotic condition. So the hypnosis is a reality and not a metaphor. Furthermore, Freud argues, in contrast to Le Bon, that working in group doesn't only lead to the to the development of unified opinions, but paradoxically also frees up impulses of wanting to distinguish oneself from the group. So in other words, to re-reflect the own self and to analyze it. In this sense, I see the whole narrative of Mario and the magician as an ego analysis of the narrator. Thomas Mann makes no secret of it that the narration stems from an actual holiday experience. But from his correspondence, we also know that it was his older daughter, Erica, who gave the story its final form. So the structure of a tragic travel experience, that's the subtitle of the final form of the narration. The surprising ending in terror, so Mario's murder of the magician, obtains an ambivalence through Erika Mann's idea that also raises further questions. We are surprised twice because neither do we know that Mario carries a gun with him, nor do we expect that he would use it in order to murder Cipolla. Even though Thomas Mann used the genre novella for Mario and the Magician, he quickly started using the term narrative. This is why in German you can find the text in the Tome Späte Erzählungen translated as late narratives. Rhetorically speaking, the Mario texts are a much older genre, namely an apology, that a genre that dates back to Plato. Even in the first few sentences of the narration, there is an apologetic tone when the narrator voices his regret of not having been able to put to bed his wife and kids earlier. The terrible Chipola, who creates the illusion to an excited and restless public of having a selection of different entertainments, is not solely responsible for the catastrophe in the eyes of the narrator. He says that the unusually hot weather also played a role. As always with Thomas Munn, the exact wording of his prose is worth noting. The heat was excessive. Should I list that? The word anführen in German, so to adduce, suggests that the narrator isn't solely responsible for the politically and culturally dangerous tendencies of the evening's entertainment. During the magician's performance, however, things seem to change, especially because of his way of interacting with the public that shows strong parallels with the Italian fascists. Cipolla succeeds in taming the constantly heckling young people in his performance, as is evidenced by the way he cracks his riding whip. The young people compete with Cipolla, but they also provide him information that he wouldn't know anything about otherwise. When interacting with Mario, that becomes evident. In the dialogue between Cipolla and Mario about Mario's daytime job. And here I would like to show you the only existing site uh, page of a manuscript. Beautiful. This is 
one single page of a manuscript, there is no one left, no other one left. And I would like to look at two paragraphs here, passages here. The first line at the very top, of course, as is always the case with the number one. That line shows the second half of Cipolla's question about Mario's daytime work. And secondly, the fifth line from the bottom, where Mario starts getting bolder when answering Cipolla's questions. Don't worry, I'm not able to fluently read the old German cursive, and there won't be an exam in the end. We will look at, well, I don't know whether I can have this line shown here. Well, it doesn't work. Cipolla asks whether Mario works at a dry goods shop during the daytime. And you see the last word, the last word is dry goods shop. In a cafe, Mario answers. And we can see here, in my opinion, we can see that Mario continues to show some resistance towards Cipolla's suggestions. When it turns out that Mario doesn't work in a dry goods store as um, Cipolla su um, suspects, but in a cafe, Cipolla obtains some success when admitting that he was wrong, stating Mario was working in a dry goods store. And that makes the young people moving to his side. So it's a very skillful mix of a rhetorical skill, bilingual jokes, card tricks, but also malice and brutality. Sometimes he creates different impressions on the public. As is shown in the touching and spooky scene with Frau Angeleri, in which the lady is willing to leave the stage with Cipolla, seemingly totally being under Cipolla's spell, while he walks backwards as if engaged in ballroom dancing. This is a very comical scene. In the back and forth of the public response, we can see the two poles of Freud's essay, so group psychology and the analysis of the ego. The stylized erotics of Cipolla leading Miss Angeleri across the stage infects the, the public or the spectators, and not even her husband at the beginning thinks of intervening. It's not until the very last minute that he calls his wife by her first name. Sophronia, come back. But when that doesn't, when he doesn't succeed in it, he cries out, accidente, meaning damn it, and he brings the whole scene to a close. Still, we might ask, was Frau Angeleri really under the spell of hypnosis, or was she just playing in this scene? That's a very important question. 
What really happened remains unclear, but reminds me of the occult experience that Mann had at Schrenk Dotzing in Munich. During the seances, Mann remains neutral. He doesn't want to insult Schrenk Notzing. But the certain happenings in the seances give him food for thought. How can a typewriter suddenly start typing when the arms and legs of the medium are tied together? In contrast to Frau Angeleri, Mario resists fun falling under Cipolla's spell by trying to objectively answer his questions. When Cipolla tries to keep his advantage, the group of cheeky fellows plays an important role because it is them who provide the magician with the needed information. And this is why Cipolla lightly cracks his whip in the direction of the group in order for them not to forget that they are the ones contributing to his success of obtaining new information. In that case, the question is about the first name of Mario's girlfriend. To Mario's shame, to Mario's great shame, one of the know-it-all young men cries out the name Silvestra. However, Silvestra is Mario's mother's name, a laundress. And in the fifth line from the bottom, here on the picture, you can see how Mario says, no, signore, because Cipolla asked him whether he was heartbroken. No, signore, answers Mario. So, Silvestra is Mario's mother's name, who's a laundress. So, when Mario carries out Cipolla's demand to kiss the magician as if he were Mario's mother, Silvestra, we can ask ourselves whether in this new version of the narrative, Mario was indeed hypnotized. Well, he carries out the shameful kiss while Cipolla softly cracks his whip underneath the table. Then you can hear two shots from the small gun with which Mario murders Cipolla. Oh, now you can see the bottom part of the page of the manuscript a bit clearer. So, no, signore, he answers, and then you can see some corrections in the text. Then you can hear two shots, as I said. So can it be that the grotesque kiss on Mario's behalf was a kind of gruesome parody? Can you wake up from a full hypnosis so quickly and suddenly fire a gun? It's really hard to say, but I have my suspicions. Ladies and gentlemen, let's slowly come to a close. My main argument wouldn't be complete without a few comments on the Felix Kroll drafts from the years 1953 and 54, where Mann revives Freud's concept of the ego analysis with new refinements. As I've already hinted at in connection to Mario and the Magician, Freud's title is about two poles that, as I've stated, 
provide a balance of power. Sometimes the psychology of the masses has the upper hand, sometimes the ego analysis does. I'm thinking of parts of the cruel novel where Felix, while working at the hotel, thinks about people being interchangeable. And he wants to save Marquis Louis de Venosta from a compulsory offer on behalf of his parents. That compulsory offer would have obligated de Venosta of, to take a longer world trip with the hope of him developing other interests due to the physical and geographical distance from his lover, Zaza. Felix has the brilliant idea of undertaking the journey under the Marquis's name. Felix's skill of imitating other people's handwriting plays a central role here. That skill will permit, permit Felix to withdraw money on all his stops all around the world. He would also be able to write letters to Louis de Venosta's parents in order to be able to um, express the progress of his journey. At first, Louis de Venosta is delighted with this idea. However, he sees the project from a different perspective than Felix. Because contrary to Felix, Louis believes in a fundamentally unchangeable state of the ego of the self. So accounting, uh, according to that, Louis de Venosta states that he would need to double himself or divide himself in two in order to be able to partake in this trip around the world while the other part of him staying in Paris with his girlfriend. So for de Venosta, only the Paris self would be the real one. But Felix finds this train of thought uncomfortable because he doesn't have the intention, uh, because he has the intention of playing the part of the Marquis. And in order to fully enjoy that experience, it would be pos uh, it would be necessary to banish all his earlier memories. So logically, that would lead to a distinct loss of all memories from his childhood and his youth. Louis de Venosta has only shared sparse details of his younger years, so they are very vague to Felix. Funnily enough for us as readers, these memories are connected to pictures of English castles that Felix saw while cleaning plates at the hotel restaurant. The castles on porcelain plates are part of his own memories that we, he would need to banish while taking on the role of de Venosta. Here, Felix is confronted with a logical impossibility because the pictures of the castles on porcelain are part of the banished memories that he shouldn't that shouldn't have their place in his new existence as Louis de Venosta. Eckhart Heftrick states, and rightfully so, that the late Felix Kroll drafts failed due to this puzzle. To conclude, I would like to emphasize that my topic, Thomas Mann and crowd psychology, is less about transferring theories of social psychology than about the sophistication with which Mann gives a literary shape to the developments of his time. The examples from my talk are a lot more nuanced and varied than you might think at first. 
And working on this complexity seems to have given great pleasure to Thomas Mann. He really liked to read out the comical passages from his works, be it in public readings or in the trusted circle of family and friends. We have concluded that neither the size of a the crowd nor their potential danger are responsible for the mechanisms observed by Mann. The impulses for an ego analysis can be triggered by experiences from boarding school or a fraternity. It may even be a large array of potential experiences, such as those anticipated by Felix, that can lead to an ego analysis. So in that sense, the trip around the world would have the same function as Freud's crowd in his essay, so being a trigger of self-analysis. But it's a tough knot to crack how this mechanism really works. We should indeed, or what should indeed be stated is that Mann had an eye for the comical of self-analysis and that he had a talent to portray all the facets of it, which led to an unforgettable joy or, as Felix Krull would say, a delicious refreshment. Yeah, vielen Dank. Well, thank you. I don't know whether there is anybody who has a question or... Well, let me first of all thank you, because we owe great thanks to you, and it is greatly unfortunate that we cannot have a discussion in the context of our virtual meeting here. But I definitely would like to thank you for these more than delicious refreshments with which you have ended your keynote. Normally now, obviously, we would move over to informal drinks and conversations that we would share with you on the basis of what you have just shared with us. This, however, is now not possible to our great uh, regrets. I found your presentation extremely enriching. Much food for thought was there, particularly also with regard to the political aspect of the analysis of crowd psychology. It's perfectly clear that with regard to Thomas Mann, the political aspects are not foregrounded, but are rather providing a background to the stories. And I would also have been interested in whether this uh, series of analysts of um, crowd psychological phenomena that have been received in the United States and criticized, whether William Reich would have played a role with this mass psychology of fascism from 1933, well knowing, of course, that Wilhelm Reich was an enfant terrible, even in uh, uh, the context of uh, uh, mass psychology. But I would have a host of questions. I'm sure many others would also have uh, many other questions. But we have to make do with what we got from you. And we thank you very much for your keynote on behalf of everyone. I certainly hope that uh, the conversation that we unfortunately cannot have now will take place in some other context at an occasion in the near future. And perhaps you might, who knows, travel to Zurich when traveling again becomes possible. So thank you very, very much indeed. And I thank everyone for having listened or anyone who will listen at any other time. Have a good evening. I would also like to thank you for this interesting proposition. It challenges me in seeing the trip around the world a bit differently. So we might think about whether we could look at it in a different way. Maybe I stopped rather quickly 
while talking about losing the old self. Yeah. Uh, yes, as I said, it is very difficult to be having this debate uh, in this uh, medium, in this context. But yes, it would be a thought to continue. I don't know whether there is a final signal to all of us uh, that would make it pertinently clear to all of us that this is the ending of our lecture. Uh, greetings go to Harvard, Cambridge, and I wish you a very nice day here. We have already entered into the reign of night.